Alright, what's up everyone? Welcome back to the channel. I'm Tokenizer, and I'm here to bring you guys in-depth analysis, news, and insights from the digital asset space, along with covering the progressive tokenization of the world. So in today's video, I'm bringing you guys another Terramoon exclusive for my free weekly show on there, Tea Time with Token, where I bring in-depth macroeconomic and crypto fundamentals every Monday at 12pm Pacific Standard Time. So if you guys do want to catch those weekly deep dives and in addition to everything else we offer such as first access to connections I've dug up, daily alpha drops, our accumulation and distribution zones, and much more, be sure to check out Terramoon Ventures with my discount code TOKENICE. That's T-O-K-E-N-I-C-E. -E. And as always, that'll be right down in the description below. So in this week's episode of Tea Time, we went in depth into essentially the history of money and the forming of this continuously growing global debt bubble we're in. And we took a trip way back to the early 1900s and kind of connected it all to everything that's happening in the macro landscape today. And before we get started, I just got to remind you guys that I'm not a financial advisor and therefore nothing you ever hear or read from either myself or Terramoon Ventures is any form of financial or investment advice. But now that we got that out of the way, let's get right into it. Alright, so we're going to be doing a breakdown on the history of fiat currencies or I guess more so the history of money in this uh, episode of Tea Time today. So we're gonna zoom back all the way to the early 1900s where it all started. And then we're gonna come more towards the uh, more modern current day. And uh, the reason we're doing this, uh, you guys will see, is because all of this ties together back from the 1900s. So we've essentially connected the dots in the past to this kind of finan global financial debt bubble that we're in today. Uh, it's really interesting how it all ties together, so I'm really looking forward to breaking this down. Okay, so, uh, start in the early 1900s. This was the peak of the British Empire, and essentially this was the largest empire, the one of the largest empires the world had ever seen. But in the late 1800s, they were starting a war with the Germans. They had already beat the French, Dutch, Spain, and a lot of other countries in the late 1700s to 1800s. So they were seen as a pretty dominant powerhouse. And in this image above, we can see kind of uh, the countries that they had that were part of this empire. So anything in red was essentially part of the, this British empire. Now, let's go to June 28th of 1914 now. This was the shooting of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, and what happened was uh, the driver actually took the wrong turn, and he gets Archduke shot. This is what started up all of World War I, so I can't remember the exact details as to uh, kind of the controversy beforehand, but part of World War One, we saw was the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. So this is, again, another one of the largest empires that stood, and it stood a good 600 plus years, but its collapse was due to World War One. And in here, we can kind of see some of the countries that were part of the Ottoman Empire, and kind of the progression that it took them to kind of see this all fall apart. So we see places like... Iran, Arabia, Egypt, Hungary, Russia, Austria. And so in World War I, we saw 20 million deaths from the rise of technology. Because prior to this, we hadn't seen technology at this level, right? We hadn't seen tanks or planes or jets. So the amount of damage that was seen, not just to the population, but even obviously to overall just destroying up property and everything was unprecedented. This leads us to 1919, and this is when the Treaty of Versailles was published. So this was an agreement between the UK, Germany, US, and France as a peace treaty, and part of it in there had a war repatriation payment by Germany to sort of offset the damages in a sort of gentleman's agreement. And uh, 
The issue with this is, this debt at the time was completely unpayable. Like, this amount of money wasn't seen anywhere in the world prior. And if we were to take it to today's money, that would be somewhere around $440 billion in debt accounting for today's inflation. And while that doesn't sound like a lot, you have to keep in mind at the time, economies were far smaller than how they are now, and technology wasn't even close to where it is today. So production and economic growth was far slower than where it is today. So a debt of 440 billion would have taken, I don't know, a long ass time to recoup. And so because of this, Germany actually tried to pay off this debt, but they couldn't. I on I'm honestly not sure if anyone thought they could repay the debt until there is more technology and economic expansion. They can't repay their debt, so what do they do? The same thing that every other country does when they can't repay their debt. They debase their currency to pay off debt. Now this is a bit different from inflation. Inflation can happen through economic growth. Debasement of currency happens through devaluing your sovereign currency and making it weaker relative to every other currency out there. So, to give you guys an example of how bad it got, and it got really bad. So, in March of 1922, uh, so remember, the Treaty of Versailles was uh, signed in 1919. So, in March of 2022, 160 German marks, which was the currency they were using at the time, equaled one US dollar. In November of 1923, so just about a year after, one US dollar equaled 4.2 trillion German marks. That, now that's insane. This is over the course of a year. So th this had rose essentially... I, I don't know the exact math, but I think that's over a million percent. And so obviously this caused the German collapse by debasement and hyperinflation. Now we jump forward a bit. Uh, this leads to Black Thursday. So this is one of the worst days in all of Wall Street. We saw 12.8 million shares sold in one day, and the total market lost about 11%. And well, in a week, it wiped out $30 billion. And again, that may or may not sound like as much when we compare that to today's money. I guess $30 billion in one week is still quite a hefty amount, but you gotta keep in mind at the time, that was an unprecedented amount of money. And so, this actually took about a thousand days to bottom so we see here this is the Dow Jones and well this was a pretty terrifying economic collapse and we have to keep in mind at the time central banks really didn't have as much power now we skip forward to kind of the economic collapse of Germany and kind of seeing market fears around pretty much everyone in the world this led to the rise of Hitler in the 1930s and this led to Nazism, which in return led to World War II. And well, people thought World War I was bad seeing 20 million people die and all the damages, not just in property, but also financial damages because funding a war is insanely expensive, right? So this saw 70 million people die. That's 3.5 times the amount in World War I. And then we skip forward to 1933. This saw the New Deal. The New Deal was essentially a sort of deal in terms of fi uh, fiscal policy and it allowed physical fiscal stimulus through capping interest rates, aka yields. And so they kind of allowed inflation to run versus bonds to kind of have lower debt within th their economy. A large reason for this is to rebuild the damages from the war because World War II not didn't just see a lot of people dying, right? But we also saw a lot of damage within the economy itself, both in terms of financial policy and also, well, physically, because buildings get damaged and stuff, right? So essentially, they artificially lowered interest rates to further stimulate spending within the economy. And now this leads to the official end of World War II. Japan essentially surrenders and World War II ends. Everyone's really happy and they're celebrating. And while the happiness doesn't last long, essentially the humans have too much sex and this leads to the largest population boom we've seen at the time, which we'll get into, but let's talk about 
world globalization quickly. So essentially globalization means we're getting away from all the sort of empires and everything and we're establishing these global organizations. So in 1944, we saw Bretton Woods won. This was essentially all currencies being tied to the US dollar and the gold standard. 1946, we saw the rise of the United Nations, the UN, and we've seen kind of the impact they've had all around the world on kind of global issues over the years. 1947, we saw the general agreements on tariffs and trades. We'll come back to this later because there's, uh, there's a lot of changes that has happened on this since then. 1949, we saw the rise of NATO. And then 1957, we saw the rise of the European Union. So these are all centralized powers of globalization, right? Now let's move on for, to what happened after 1945. And this was the largest population boom we'd seen. And we can see the chart here. I mean, obviously you can't tell too much because this is just an image and not an interactive chart. But essentially you can see from this curve just the amount of growth they had in the span of, well, when was this? from 1955 to 1985. So, over the course of 20 years, 78 million people were born in the US. They essentially had a population growth of 40% in about 20 years. Global population grew about 30%. Now, that's absolutely insane because you have to keep in mind when population booms happen eventually down the line, that plays into a larger, larger role as each person's marginal utility and demand just rises more and more and then you have to place that on a global scale and then this leads us to the 1950s boom this was kind of the last real boom we ever saw and by boom we kind of mean real wages actually rising versus inflation real wages you can essentially calculate by taking the future value of your salary and dividing it by inflation the standard of living were rising absolutely to the moon and a large reason for this is because all the technology we had from war, so stuff like tanks, jets, that turned to consumer goods. So we got things like cars and washing machines. And so inflation rises somewhat due to kind of uh, natural consumption now, right? Because there's more demand overall for these products as they're kind of seen as new products that weren't available in previous generations due to all this technology and costs being funneled into war. And now this uh, leads us sort of to this new age. So if we look up here quickly, the largest population boom was about 18 years ago now. These guys have all begun entering the workforce and all begun kind of uh, setting on life things. Starting a family, buying a car, owning a home. And the marginal rate of consumption just absolutely explodes. Because you remember what we were talking about here when we were saying how for each person being born their marginal rate of utility and demand rises more and more as they get older and that makes sense right when you're a baby you really don't need that much like your parents probably provide everything for you as you grow a little older to a child or a teenager your marginal utility begins to grow more and more you consume more food you probably need more clothes and you need supplies and stuff for school and then scale that out to when you're an adult. Uh, you want to move out of your own place or your parents' place. You have to buy your own food. You need your own car. And you're going to need a job now. Now that's just one person. Remember, the population grew by 40% in the U.S. over 20 years. So just imagine that multiplied by, well, <laughs> an extra 40% of whatever the U.S. economy was at the time. So this leads to essentially the largest demand shock we'd ever seen because essentially demand for that specific demographic was completely unprecedented. We'd never seen that many people of a similar demographic in such a short amount of time. And so by 1975, the average baby boomer was in the workforce. And this was the highest increase ever in the labor force because of so many people at once joining the labor force and prices completely explode from the change in aggregate demand so as we were saying you're probably gonna want to buy a house you're probably gonna need a suit for work and you're gonna need a car 
And of course you're going to need food and furniture. So when you scale that out to essentially the largest population boom, the demand or the costs for everything just absolutely rises because demand like that has never been seen before. And here I kind of highlighted the employment level from uh, 1965 all the way to 1974. So this is around when the boom baby boomers started entering the workforce, right? And we saw a rise in about 22%. So talking further on, further on uh, price explosion. So demand obviously exceeds supply now. The only way supply increases is if we find other ways to create more of something, right? So that could be through technology, creating more efficiency and less labor and costs to produce things. Commodities and real estate go to the moon. Uh, this was, I mean, this is probably expected because housing is very high in demand and obviously when you have that much people, general commodities like gas and food, they're gonna rise a lot too. And you have to keep in mind, these baby boomers are also around the age where they'd be starting their own family now, too. So essentially, the US is running on twin deficits while pegged to gold now. Twin deficits essentially means that a country has a current account deficit and government budget spending deficit at the same time. And an account deficit means its imports exceeds its outports. So when a country does trades with another country in terms of kind of, well, mac macro trade finance and then there's a budget deficit a budget deficit is essentially government spending that outpaces their own revenue so this would be from like taxation so in 1971 august 15th nixon actually dropped the gold standard because they realized they couldn't be running on twin deficits while pegged to gold seeing the explosion in demand and prices because their gold reserves were Pretty much, well, they weren't running on empty, but at that rate, they would have gone empty real soon. Inflation was pretty much too far to contain as demand exceeded supply by miles at that point. But the issue here was that assets rise because of the ability to essentially print money now, right? Without having it be back to gold. Real wages don't rise. In fact, real wages haven't gone up since 1975. Now, the reason why wages stopped going up is because of this population boom. There's so many people now, so companies don't have to compete to give the best wage for uh, a specific worker because it's not like there was a lack of supply of workers now. Rather, the demand for people wanting to work was at an all-time high. So essentially, the American dream of owning a white picket fence, having a nice family while working your basic job, that was shattered. It's gone, and that's never coming back. So what's the problem now? We're, we started in the early 1900s, and we've gone to 1971 now. The problem is, post-World War II, people got too excited and had too many kids. There was way too much demand added at once for technology to catch up to supply and distribution. And now let's go into the 1980s now. Uh, so this is uh, largely dominated by Regan and Thatcher. So this started off with Thatcher. Uh, she had the idea of selling council homes. Council homes were essentially free housing for low income families, which was part of the benefit from the post-World War II stimulus because they kind of needed to help these people out. So they were like, okay, let's help them out further by selling them these houses at very, very undervalued prices. Now keep in mind they were living in these houses for free before. So on the upside, everyone's happy, right? The people, the low income households are like, well, they, they've essentially won them over because they're like, wow, you're selling us these assets at record low prices. The downside that they don't see is that everyone that was a creditor before is now paying debts and essentially becoming a slave to the system until they can pay off those debts. Regan, uh, he does something somewhat similar in the sense that he kind of deregulates the credit markets and Wall Street begins to rise because of this because credit is so much more easily accessible now. The downside, of course, is over leverage. It always is. And so the world starts financializing at unprecedented rates and 
Regan and Thatcher are the first to kind of free up the pension system and create this idea of 401ks, which are essentially tax-free retirement accounts. We go to the mid-1980s. This is kind of that turning point. And people now have access to financial markets and debt, right? Stock prices are absolutely soaring as market participation is at an all-time high. And people can kind of afford less with this with their hourly wages now because of the sudden rise in demand, right? So it's not just stocks though. Property prices also soar because of the rise in demand, because people have access to this debt to buy homes they couldn't normally before. Healthcare also now goes to the moon essentially, and nobody can afford anything anymore. So the decision was well, the decision in most of retail was, if wages don't go up but assets do, I'll just borrow more money and buy more assets and, well, if assets keep going up, I just have to repay the debt, right? So on paper, it might make sense to borrow on a depreciating asset and make up the difference, but that's easier said than done. We go to 1989 to 1990, and this leads to the fall of the Berlin Wall. The Berlin Wall was standing uh, about 28 years dividing up Germany and essentially what broke it down was globalization. It broke down the kind of ethos and rules behind the wall in kind of separating Germany's due to different political views but it was the Germans that literally tore this wall down overnight. So after this, this kind of created a bit of a chain reaction. I know it sounds kind of strange putting up a physical event like a wall falling into this but this really did start an interesting chain reaction as china realized they also needed to open up their economy and russia comes onto the free markets more which essentially led to globalization like we'd never seen before and kind of an abundance in global trade because we have to keep in mind russia owns more natural resources than all of the other countries combined so it's really fascinating how rich they are in that sense and well we're kind of seeing the consequences of it when we take that away uh from the sanctions we're seeing right now right remember how we were talking about the general agreements on tariffs and trades that they made during the globalization of the world back it towards uh the second world war this became the world trade organization essentially this allowed globalized liberalized free trade with no tariffs on any other countries but we all know that's not true because countries always impose tariffs on one another anyways but this was really a double-edged sword because now it's not the u.s worker versus the u.s worker which is already in excess supply but it's the average u.s worker versus the global average worker and with competitive wages all around the world well well i don't want to say competitive wages but the U.S. essentially giving out one of the best wages relative to some other th third world countries. Well, the competition just gets that much harder. And if we also look at the rise of silicone chips and computers in the 1980s, Moore's Law essentially exploded and technology began replacing jobs. Moore's Law essentially states that the number of transistors in a microchip doubles about every two years or so. Though the cost of computers is halved. But this has become kind of an outdated law as the pace of technology isn't quite rising to that extent anymore. But essentially, this was now baby boomers versus a globalized workforce of cheaper labor around the world, a rise in technology, debt, and an excess supply of workers. So this was really just a big fuck you in that time to kind of uh the baby boomers and now if we skip to 1987 we saw something we had never seen before and this was the cutting of interest rates so during 1987 there was a huge market crash and alan greenspan wanted to essentially save the business cycle from kind of going into its recessionary phases so what does he do? He cuts interest rates to stabilize the panic. And central bankers around the world begin to realize this as a tool to kind of control the business cycle. And they start taking note of it. And this eventually leads to uh, a bit of a messy downturn 
So we skip another decade uh, into 1998 now. This is the overleveraged Asian crisis, which uh, pretty much saw too much leverage in Japan, Singapore, China, Hong Kong, Thailand, and a lot of other developing countries. Or not developing countries, but countries that were rapidly developing at the time. Because during this time, I mean, a lot of these countries were really thriving. Like, Japan in particular was doing amazingly well. So, this leverage largely led in these emerging markets, right? These markets, in US dollar terms, fall 90% around the world. But, that's okay, right? Because these are economies in other countries that aren't based in the US dollar. Sure, that would be fine. The issue is, all this debt was taken in US dollars. And they don't earn US dollars. So... Now you guys are seeing how this problem's arising, right? And the IMF initially encouraged these capital flows, but then they had to bail everyone out because essentially this debt was unpayable. Much like the debt we saw in uh, the early 1900s from Germany. And so just an example of some of these. The South Korean stock exchange took 20 years before it could make another new all-time high. Taiwan also took another 20 years, and Japan still never recovered back to their all-time highs. So that goes to show you just how bad some of these economic bubbles can get. And there's actually some pretty interesting documentaries on kind of the uh, Japanese economy in respects to kind of what's happened. I believe it's called The Lost Decade, if anyone wants to check it out. But this leads us to 1999 now. This led to the hedge fund boom. And this saw record numbers of people investing and incentivized by those 401ks that re came out back from Regan and Thatcher, right? So people now felt a little better. They had a sense of security in having retirement money through investments and having a secure source of income to do so. Now here's the issue. Wall Street leverages their money for their own benefit and when I say their money, I'm talking about these people that are trying to retire. And banks are making record margins. And the issue is long-term capital management essentially blows up because of all this leverage. So what happens? Alan Greenspan cuts rates again and the markets are saved. The economy looks fine on paper again. But eventually cutting rates does uh, come back to bite you, right? And this is where the bubble starts. So, these big banks kind of realize the Fed will keep on bailing them out. I mean, they've done it twice now, right? They've cut rates twice. They'd never done that before. So they're like, okay, well, we think the Fed is on our side, so we're going to ape in even further. And so asset prices keep going up, and people have to borrow even more money now. And in fact, household income versus household debt now is levered up to 25x. I mean, that's ridiculous, like... <laughs> You can't even get, I don't think you can even get 25x leverage on KuCoin. Yet, the average household at the time was leveraged 25x. With a uh, collateral that was arguably much more risky. So, over 90% of all the global investments in the world were in the US now. As pretty much nobody wanted to touch these international emerging markets post the Asian crisis where they fell 90% versus the US dollar, right? But what happens when the US market also starts going down? Well, this was also playing in part uh, to the dot-com boom, but there was a lot more going on at the time, and everyone was thinking, is this the one that's going to blow up the debt bubble? Is this the end of it? Well, what happens? Interest rates get cut again, and markets are saved. And, well, baby boomers begin losing faith in the stock market. And rightfully so, right? <laughs> so, they're kind of unsure how they'd uh, retire without the equities market now. And this led to a little bit of a mess that we will continue talking on very shortly. But let's talk about the real estate market now. Because this is the next uh, bubble that bursts. So, the household balance sheet essentially gets wiped out from the financial crisis, and banks also close due to the collapse, and, well, we saw things like Lehman Brothers being completely over-leveraged, and this was essentially the biggest financial collapse we'd ever seen. And if we take a look at this chart, 
This is commercial real estate prices for the US. I mean, just look at this drop. This is insane. And well, it took a good three years to recover back to where it's at, right? So, what's the solution now? Because we're seeing bubble after bubble pop, pretty much. Well, what's always the solution to over-leveraged systems? Cutting interest rates so people can pay back their debts easier and continue taking out money or borrowing out money at a rate that is essentially near zero to pay back at. Now, rates have finally fallen to zero because if you keep cutting them, eventually they will fall to zero, right? So now they're thinking, okay, well, we don't have any other way to artificially stimulate the economy and have more policy control now. So what can we do? Let's print money and call it quantitative easing. And they eventually led the public to believe that quantitative easing pretty much just meant cutting rates. And the reason they're doing this is because the collateral cannot go to zero. The collateral being the US dollar. So what we're noticing now is demographics have caused this kind of debt bubble and basically to compensate wages that are also caused by demographics, which ties directly into them celebrating in World War II when people were having way too many babies. And because of this population growth, people are competing with each other around the world for gradually less and less things as other parts of demographics begin entering the workforce too. So post-2008, what's what happens now? Well, the housing markets are gradually recovering, but inflation is still present as the M1 money supply rose by 14% in three months. M1 money supply is all money that's kept in cash and check deposits. So your most liquid form of money, essentially money that can eat or assets that can easily be converted into cash and cash itself. So assets begin going back up. Wages still aren't moving and there's no retail access to credit and lending as 2008 regulations kind of made that a really big point of focus to lower down on. So if we look here, this is the M1 money stock and we see just how much it climbed. Now this is what's really interesting because if we look here, these are the volumes for the S&P 500 and here it is in present day. We've never come close to the volumes back in pre-2008 days. So that just goes to show you that it's not quite exactly the, like th these assets have still gone up, right? But they haven't gone up relative to the actual denominator because this rise is largely driven by the denominator itself going down, being the US dollar. So the TLDR for this is assets go up, but your wages stay the same. You actually get poorer because you can afford less and less of each asset. This leads us into kind of the start of the everything bubble. And this is post 08. So this looks good on paper because CPI appears to be getting cheaper due to the basket of goods being cheaper thanks to technology because production is so much cheaper now. But assets are still getting more expensive. The S&P 500 versus gold, it looks fine. It's one standard deviation expensive, but that's not something that's groundbreaking. But some things weren't making sense. People were still getting poorer post-08, but asset prices were still going up. So if we take a look, why is that? Well, this blue line is the Australian Central Bank's balance sheet. This white line is real property prices in Australia. What do we see? It's essentially gone to zero versus the Australian Central Bank's balance sheet. We look at China, same thing. White real property prices, orange Central Bank balance sheet. The US? Very similar thing. So what we're seeing is the central bank or essentially the rich getting richer, but pretty much everything, everything else staying stagnant. And that's because asset prices are rising, but the denominator itself is getting weaker and weaker. Now, there are two things that actually beat the central bank balance sheet. Only two things, and we'll get into that in just a moment. So people around the world are furious, right? Wages don't go up, costs such as education and living are going up, 
The majority of boomers can't retire due to the system blowing up, and now millennials are competing for jobs against boomers. So a lot of people are competing for jobs against their parents now. So these are the two largest demographic booms in history in the labor force at the exact same time during an economic recovery phase as technology is rapidly evolving and replacing jobs. That's a recipe for disaster. So now this leads us to the fourth turning. So this is 2012 to present. And this is a transition of power from one demographic to another. And, well, we're kind of seeing this in play. This is all of crypto, blockchain, and this rebuilding of this rules-based global order system. So we were talking about how essentially everything went to zero against the U.S. balance sheet, right? Well, let's look at this a little more. Let's not look at assets, but let's look at real things within the economy. So this light blue line is GDP. GDP stands for Gross Domestic, Pro Domestic Product. It's pretty much how much value a country can produce at a given time. GDP C1, uh, that real GDP, that is the yellow line. That is essentially GDP, so what we just talked about, but accounting for inflation and debasement. So green is the US wages line. Purple is the S&P 500. And this pink is CPI. So CPI is core price inflation. So CPI is usually measured in a basket of normal consumer goods, or at least this is the one I picked for this chart. And what do we see? And yeah, th this white line is the US central bank balance sheet. Everything's essentially going to zero against it. If we look here, these lines actually used to kind of uh, intersect in a way and kind of, well, cross each other. None of these lines are ever going to be crossing the central bank balance sheet ever again. It's grown far too much since then. Like, if we look here, and then if we want to take a deeper look, we can go to the chart here. And, well, what do we see? Well, th this is over the course of COVID, right? So let's see how much the money supply or the central bank balance sheet has grown since then. So 114%. And essentially none of this ha has moved. Look, wages have stayed stagnant. GDP stagnant. Real GDP also stagnant. The S&P had rose a bit, but I mean, it just followed what the central bank balance sheet did to a much lower extent. And of course, CPI is rising a bit, but that's kind of an inverse indicator relative to everything else we're looking at. We look here, this is a pretty similar case. So this is taking a look at some other assets. So orange line is real property prices. We see that this really hasn't moved whatsoever. Relative to the Fed balance sheet, this has not moved. Gold, it's moved a bit, but essentially it's still gone to zero versus the Fed balance sheet. The Dow Jones, very similar. Two-year bonds and 10-year bonds, also a pretty similar thing. And again, look. Two-year bonds used to be much larger than where the Fed balance sheet was until they began to cut interest rates, right? And it's visible here. This is where 08 was, and it essentially never recovered past these levels again. And so we, we're now seeing it. Everything goes to zero versus the central bank balance sheet because of debasement in currency except for two things now what are these two things one is the nasdaq the other is bitcoin and yeah th this white line is the central bank balance sheet that's how much bitcoin has grown and moved since well 2012 2013 so this is a debasement of currency it's not inflation assets look like they're going up but it's actually the value of the denominator that's dying that's making it look like these things are go growing now let's talk about the rise of the internet in the post 08 era so people are angry with everything right there's a loss of jobs rising costs in goods and services wages aren't going up central bank helping the rich keep getting richer the gap in wealth is continuing to grow 401ks are essentially blown apart along with the general market overall and the overall distrust in government is getting stronger and stronger and everyone needs to blame someone but they don't know who to blame so this essentially splits into the left and right and 
add in the internet evolving at a very rapid rate, Facebook comes out of it, and social division is now at an all-time high. And Russians begin to take notice of this, and they start using bots to spread people further and further apart. But because before this, people could still have opposing views and sit for dinner and accept their opposing views. Now, because of this division, they both hate each other. They see it as one of them is a communist and the other is a fascist. You can't have, you can't associate with people with differing views from you anymore. It's kind of ridiculous. Uh, but then this leads to a further discrepancy in specifically healthcare. <laughs> Uh, and that really ties into kind of the pandemic going on at the moment. So, Europe had also blown up due to a big financial crisis that saw them almost lose Cyprus. And because of this, they decided to give free health care. Because uh, they were thinking, okay, well, our citizens have gone through enough. We've got to gain their trust back somehow. On paper, this sounded like a great idea. But they have no way to repay these debts. And the previous debts they had from Cyprus blowing up and essentially the IMF having to bail them out. Because if you think about it, as baby boomers are reaching closer towards the age of dying, the cost of healthcare is inevitably going to continue to rise. And remember, that was one of the largest population booms we'd seen. So it's going to be a pretty unprecedented amount once it kind of gets there. So this, plus COVID, is going to make healthcare even less and less accessible than it already is around the world. And education is a very similar thing. It used to be free, but baby, the baby boomers boom essentially fucked that all up as governments couldn't pay for the abundance in education and healthcare and essentially everything else. This leads us in uh, the expansion of the biggest debt bubble. So we were talking about the everything bubble earlier. It's just continuing and grow now. Interest rates get cut to near zero again due to the pandemic. And quantitative easing is at crazy levels. Corporates begin taking on huge debt as the cost for borrowing money is at near zero now. And this creates the idea of something called zombie companies. They're ridiculously in debt, but they can survive because the cost of debt is near zero. So now, there's a government debt bubble from the stimulus and having to stimulate the economy. There's a household debt bubble because of the costs in real estate and general cost of living. There's a corporate debt bubble because of what we just mentioned before. And then obviously the financial debt bubble with everything going on. So now nothing in collateral can go down or everything is fucked because it's just going to cause an entire downward spiral once one of these bubbles pop because you have to keep in mind essentially these are all tied together so essentially now supply and demand no longer even matters the fiscal policy and financial economy is entirely up to the central bank policy it's also too late to stop it now because of the interest rate cutting that started out in the 1980s or well closer towards the 1990s this kind of creates a, uh, well, the economy being stuck in a rock in a hard place. And if we look here at this chart, this is, so, the white line is gross federal debt. So this is how much debt is in the system. This orange line is gross domestic product. And we actually saw these lines cross during, uh, 2008. Now, we'd never seen this before, right? Because if we look here, there was always a decent bit of a gap between the two. But post-2008 crisis, we're essentially running on a deficit now. And, well, essentially every gain in the economy is just an artificial gain. Well, not gain, but, like, economic growth. It's You, you could say it's not real economic growth. So, a little bit of talk about the pandemic now so all markets essentially collapsed once the pandemic kind of came in full swing right the world was essentially put on pause and the fed and government realized that the only way to survive through this is through physical stimulus or everything was going to crash to the ground so the government and fed said they would stop anyone from defaulting including households and renters they would make sure they couldn't default by essentially, well, temporarily pausing that debt. 
This led to also quantitative easing, of course, right? And this wasn't just to put money into the economy, but because remember, if one thing defaults, this thing just goes into an endless spiral and everything is going to need to be rebuilt. So this saw record levels of money printing, as we can see in these charts. So this is the uh, Federal Reserve's balance sheet. We saw this rise a total of 114%, so about double where it is uh, from the pandemic to, or from the start of the pandemic to where it is now. In 2008, we also saw something pretty similar. This rose by 147%, so a bit more, but I mean, we've never, we haven't even recovered from 08 yet, right? So it's going to be real ugly seeing the outcomes of this. M1 money supply, so we talked about what M1 was earlier, that's just very liquid assets and cash. This rose by 414%. Now, for our final slide for today, we're going to talk about J Powell to the rescue. So, did they really save everything? Uh, essentially, they printed crazy amounts of money, we all know, know that. And everything looked fine. Assets were back at all-time high prices, and the economy was essentially running on artificial stimulus, but everything seemed okay. There wasn't anyone going insolvent. But how does everything actually look? So, we see here, the S&P, since the COVID lows, it reached essentially new all-time highs, rising 119% since its COVID lows. NASDAQ, very similar thing, rose 145%. The Dow Jones rose 100, well, essentially 100%. So everything looks good, right? Economic recovery. The Fed did it. Everything looks pretty similar in the sense that it's just having a run-up. There was a couple months of a short recession, but that was about it. Everything looks fine now. Or does it? If we look here and use the balance sheet as a denominator, did anything really go up? So again, the orange line is the S&P 500, the blue line is the NASDAQ, Dow Jones is the green, and government aggregate expenditure is the purple. Nothing really went up, did it? I mean, the NASDAQ was beating kind of uh, the Fed balance sheet for a bit, but because of what we're seeing now, it is going down. And as we said, the NASDAQ does on average actually beat out the central bank balance sheet. And that's largely because technology is essentially the only thing that we can have a hope at of outpacing the growth in monetary supply nowadays all right so that was the little sneak peek into the terra moon exclusive of tea time with token we've got a lot more weekly deep dives that are all recorded and exclusively on demand for our global affiliate members so if that sounds like something you'd like to check out on top of everything else we offer like our accumulation and distribution zones daily alpha drops trade alerts and even more weekly shows be sure to check out terra moon ventures in the link right down below with my discount code tokenize and as always if you guys haven't already be sure to check out some of my other content platforms such as twitter spotify instagram telegram and medium for more fundamental crypto analysis content just like this and all this can be found at tokenizer or you can head on over to tokenizer.network for all the links to my contacts, plus much more. And of course, that'll be down in the description below. But that's about all we've got for today. I apologize for being a little inactive with the content over the past month or so. We've been a little all over the place, but we do have a quant deep dive coming out real soon, followed by another alliance block deep dive and a couple other breakdowns and overview in the works. So as always, I appreciate your guys' continued support and patience, and let's continue to keep growing and learning together. But yeah, that's about it, and as usual, be sure to stay safe and keep grinding. I'll catch you guys next time. Peace.